Man, it's always an honor to be with you. Um, to follow Jeff Mannion anytime is extremely difficult and intimidating. <laughs> to follow him today, um, I'm just almost unnerved. Um, one of my spiritual heroes, Jeff, he is. He's younger than me, just barely, but he is a a person I have looked up to for 20-some years, and I so appreciate and love him. And uh, Aaron Buer, I have deep affection for as well, and he is leading strong. Aaron is so grateful for him. Uh, but this church means a great deal to me in the Grand Rapids area. So glad to be with all of you. Again, I want to start out by saying that I truly am proud of every one of you for your spirit of humility, to want to learn and grow and become better as leaders in your churches and organizations. Uh, before we get going though, I wanna show you a couple shots of my family. This is my wife uh, and my mom. My mom is 94 years old. She still drives like a crazy maniac. Uh, walks three miles a day, drinks two pots of coffee, not on medication at all. She's a miracle. Uh, this is the rest of my family, and they're all good. Uh, my son and daughter and their spouses and seven grandkids. But the most important member of my family is my dog. I want to show you Blue. This is who he is. Oh. Tell you what, this dog has saved me many times from just despair, and I look at my dog and I say, oh, the world is good. Uh, his name is Blue. He commits unspeakable sins around the neighborhood, but it's all right. We love it. Hey, I realize that some of you, maybe all of you, in some degree, probably feel a little overwhelmed in life. I feel overwhelmed pretty much every day, and you wonder if you're going to make it because leadership and life is really hard. Might help you to know that I battled feelings of fear and inadequacy all my life. Never got good grades in school, failed Greek class, literally, in seminary, bombed a preaching class, nearly quit seminary, just very average intellect and ability all my life. After seminary, my wife and I ended up in a tiny little church in Fallen, Wisconsin. We were there for five years, making $11,000 a year. Wasn't sure I wanted to do that the rest of my life, so went back to Penn State University for three years just really to try to find my way. My wife, Laurie, and I were 34 years old at the time, living in an apartment again. No money, no job no idea what was next, 34 years old. After Penn State came to First Baptist Church in White Bear Lake, Minnesota, it was a church of 300 people and three staff who all quit my first year. <laughs> so I did the only thing, I, I might have had some issues back then. Uh, <laughs> So I did the only thing I knew how to do, and that was to show up every day, devote myself to writing the best messages I could, try to improve, and just hope for the best. Honestly, I had no plan. I had no strategy. People would ask me what my vision was, and I didn't even know what that was. Uh, there were so many points along the way when I was so discouraged by a board member, budget crisis, or conflict that I would come home many days simply wanting to quit. Nobody on the planet is more surprised than me what God chose to do through a very flawed and average person. And I tell you that to begin this talk because usually it's not how smart or how gifted you are. It's how willing you are. And will you be able to endure pain? <laughs> Lots of pain in leadership. 
Honestly, I believe the ability to endure pain, to push through it, to, to take another step toward the nec next day, to persevere through those challenging, painful, difficult seasons in life will determine how far you'll go as a leader. Can you endure? The title of this talk today is Weightlifting because there is a weightiness to life and leadership that if not managed can crush you. If life's weights aren't managed, it can damage your health for sure, your relationships, your future, and the more you accomplish as a leader or person, the more, the more your organization or church grows, the more weight gets added to your life because now more is expected of you. So in the next few minutes, we're gonna talk about our weights. And a question people ask, however, when you retire, and Jeff, I don't know if people have asked you this or not yet, but they'll say, what's on your bucket list? I actually don't have a bucket list. I don't believe in that kind of stuff. But they think that there's a list of things, like an ultimate vacation, food, ballpark, whatever, that if you go there and experience it, it will satisfy your deepest longings in life. Some people think it's grandkids. See, I don't get that. Several months ago, my wife, Laurie, and I got a call to watch my son, David, and Sarah's boys, Hank and Cy, age four and two. <laughs> then, because it was a Saturday, my son-in-law, Nellie, his last name is Nelson, Nellie, brought their three kids over to David's house, Ibby, Maisie, and Hayes. So we're at my son's house, David's house, and somehow I got separated from the other two adults Laurie and Nellie went downstairs with the baby. I got stuck alone with the four, other four upstairs, and I don't know why, but whenever I'm with the kids, it goes from playing nicely to utter chaos and carnage. It just happens every single time. First, it's the track meet. You know, running full speed through the living room, kitchen, round around the island, screaming screaming. <laughs> Laurie and Nellie said it sounded like a stampede upstairs. I said, well, yeah, but they never came up to help. <laughs> I was sitting on the couch when Maisie, age three, peeled off the track meet and launched herself on my lap, nearly ruining me. She grabbed, for, <laughs> she grabbed for my glasses and found great joy in trying to rip them off my face while fending her off. Ibby landed on my back, followed by the two boys who ran full speed and threw themselves on top of me. And this was the honest thought that I had in that moment. This is Lord of the Flies, and I'm the pig. <laughs> and they're going to kill me right here. After knocking a couple of them off, Hank picked up a ball and threw it at me. I thought, OK, game on. I, re <laughs> I returned fire, and that's all it took. A teddy bear went sailing across the room. Then it was anything they could get their hands on, cars, blocks, monkeys, dolls. I said, Silas, no cars. <laughs> Hank, drop that truck. No kidding, he had a, a metal fire truck he was ready to throw at me. <laughs> it got so out of control, the only thing I could do was leave. <laughs> so I head for the basement, but before I reached the stairs, a metal car came flying past my head, crashed into the wall. I didn't even look back. I just went downstairs. The four kids followed me with fistfuls of ammo. And finally, my wife yelled. She said, that's enough. We're done. Then she looked at me. She said, why didn't you do something? I said, they're total barbarians. Who's raising these kids anyway? Obviously, we love our grandkids, okay? But if you're waiting for kids or grandkids to fulfill you, forget it. <laughs> there is a level of hard when you have kids that's almost unbearable. It's like an explosion that shatters everything in your home, including your schedule, your budget, and sleep. And if you don't make adjustments, it can ruin you. 
Now, the goal isn't to avoid life's challenges because if it was, you'd never get married. <laughs> Marriage is the hardest thing you'll ever do. You'd never have kids. That's the second hardest thing you'll ever do. You'd never get a job, buy a home, or become a pastor, teacher, leader, or anything else. It's not to eliminate life's challenges because that's not possible. And it's not good. But it is possible to structure your life in a way that you can survive the weight and even thrive. There were three different times when I had so mismanaged the weights in my life that I almost lost my career in church. And I was one fight away from losing my marriage. Each of those times happened in my 40s and early 50s when our church was expanding. People thought I was succeeding. But I can tell you behind the scenes, I was falling apart and just angry. And I've mentioned this a couple of years ago to this group, if you were here. So the board, my church board, began having private meetings without me to discuss my termination. But then they gave me one more chance if I went to counseling, if I, if I agreed to go to counseling. So for a full year, my counselor, Fred, Fred, interviewed everybody who knew me, all my colleagues, my staff, my family members, my friends, anybody who knew me, what's good about Bob, what's bad about Bob, and he put together 250 pages of feedback that he and his assistant read back to me word for word over a two-day uh, gut punch down at his retreat center. And I heard words, phrases repeated over and over again like these. Bob is angry. Bob doesn't listen. He doesn't know how to love. He's hard to work for. But then I heard words that my son said about me. I wonder why my dad is so angry all the time. And it crushed me. But it also saved me from destroying my family and my career. The first thing Fred said to me is, Bob, you have to quit teaching, preaching at the seminary because I was doing that on the side in addition to trying to lead this church. It was a weight that was tipping me into the danger zone. So I just want to raise a question. I wonder what might be tipping some of you into the danger zone of burnout. I'm coaching a 41-year-old pastor right now whose church has grown from zero to 3,000, but he is so stressed, he won't make it to 50. I told his board that the number one asset for the future of their church is their pastor's health, but he's at severe risk. He's got four kids, preaches four times Sunday morning, which is an absolute killer, and he's underpaid. This pastor said to me, and I quote, we're so stressed financially that I think about money every minute of the day. So he started a podcast to try to earn extra money from sponsors. I said, does your board know how stressed you are and that it's related to your pay? So I had a Zoom call this board and I asked them if they could do something about that and they did and it saved them but what was tipping him into the danger zone was a podcast that he didn't have time for. Maybe for some of you it's teaching at other churches or coaching kids sports or having too many social commitments. I can tell you one of the biggest reasons our church thrived is because of all the things I didn't do. I didn't travel like I am today and didn't sleep last night in a hotel. I didn't travel, speak, blog, or tweet. I stopped doing mission trips because I'd come home in a body bag every time. I offloaded counseling people and we didn't buy a second home or cabin. Is there anything you're doing outside of the normal weights of marriage, kids if you have them, work, that's putting you at risk? Uh, Kyle Eidelman, 
uh, one of the finest speakers today in our country, wrote a book, When Your Way Isn't Working. Kyle talks about how adding one more thing was absolutely killing him. He said, my just one more thing way of life wasn't working. You might add just one more thing to your calendar, which doesn't seem like much, but it makes everything feel heavier. He said he was spotting a friend at the gym who was bench pressing 225 pounds and wanted to try 230 pounds, just five pounds more. So he put two, two and a half pound extra weights on either side. And Kyle helped his friend lift the bar off the support and he couldn't do it. He said, get it off. Help me get this off my chest. <laughs> Gang, five pounds is nothing. But when it's added to 225, it became too much. So if 225 represents the weight the weights of a full-time job, marriage, marriage if you're married, kids, friendships, and fitness. But then you add a seemingly small five-pound mentoring role weight. It can collapse the whole thing. You know, what are some signs that maybe you're overloaded and heading for a crash? Irritability is number one. I can tell you, and I'll confess this, I was irritable most of my adult life, and I still get irritable, just cranky. Um, fatigue and insomnia is another one. Do we have, do we have that? Yeah. Irritability, fatigue, and insomnia. This is, this is interesting. When you're exhausted, it, it's oftentimes you can't sleep. If that's happening to you, pay attention. Something might need to be adjusted. Three others real quickly, you lose your joy. If you're just headed for burnout, heading for a crash, feelings of despair. Oh, I'm just, I'm just not gonna make it. Having escapist thoughts. Where can I go numb this? What can I do to escape? I just get mad and snap at people. <laughs> uh, ten, I just got, 10 years ago, I was on a 20 mile bike ride and whenever I see somebody ahead of me, uh, I, I just want to catch up and beat them, even though they don't know they're in the race. <laughs> I just, there's something that drives me. Okay, I got to catch that guy or catch that gal. That day I was, a long, I was on a long stretch. There were two other bikers a quarter mile ahead of me. So I bore down. I caught the first guy. But the second guy pedaled strong and steady. So I bore down, pedaled harder, finally passed him on his left. But a minute later... He caught up with me. And as he passed me, he said, watch it on the right, which immediately irked me. <laughs> I was immediately irked. Plus, nobody passes on the right. He said, watch it on the right. And I said, you don't have to worry about me, pal. To which he said, and you don't have to worry about me. We were in our little spandex shorts, <laughs> you know, tough guys. And I wanted to bump him into the ditch. He was probably another pastor. <laughs> a Lutheran one. You can't, you can't let a Lutheran beat you. And so I sped up, and I never saw him again. But a mile later, I thought, what's wrong with me? What's wrong? I was just mad at everything. And then Ephesians 5 says, be careful of that. Be careful, Bob, how you live. Don't be an idiot. Don't be unwise, but understand what God's will is. What is God's will? First Thessalonians, be joyful always. Are you kidding me? I failed there. Pray continually. Give thanks <laughs> in all circumstances. I had some work to do. That's hard to do when you're so exhausted, you're just mad. 
So in the few minutes we have left, I want to offer my best shot at weightlifting so we can live with joy and thankfulness instead of anger and resentment. Six weightlifters, number one, ask for help. <laughs> Just ask from your spouse, friend, counselor, or board member. Solomon said two are better than one. I didn't learn this early enough in life. Two are better than one, but pity the person who has nobody. One of our biggest dangers, I believe, as leaders is isolation. I got this. Don't need you. Where we're walled off from trusted colleagues and friends who would help us if we asked. So I want to ask you, who's helping you? Who encourages and protects you? Not everybody can help because they don't have enough experience or maturity. But who's helping you carry the weight of leadership? I'd encourage you just to jot those names down in the margin, even just now as you're thinking, who is, who's ahead of me in life? Who is encouraging me, lifting me? The most important thing some of you could do this week is start looking for three to four people who are ahead of you in life, in all areas in life. They are ahead of you spiritually, career-wise, relationally. They just have it together. They've got 10 years on you, 20 years on you. They are ahead of you. The best thing some of us could do is identify who those people are and ask them, would you be willing to meet with me once a month, just informally, to help me? It's not a Bible study. It's not much of an agenda, but you might have a question or two and you come to that meeting and do it once a month for a year. I'm telling you, people like Dean Hager, Terry Shepard, and Al Holland saved my life. Maybe not the first year. Five years later, ten years later, these three guys surfaced and just saved me. Some of us spend too much time with people who are immature, emotionally draining, and suck the life out of you. So look around. Are there people in your circle who are ahead of you, who advise and challenge and encourage you instead of drain you each time you see them. To lift the weight, break out of isolation, ask for help. Second, wake up grateful. Tr try this every single day. Think of something to be grateful for. What's your first thought every morning? Is it, wow, I made it. I lived through the night. This little muscle, this heart kept beating 2,000 gallons of blood every single... It's, it's amazing, and I take it for granted. My lungs kept breathing. The earth kept spinning 1,000 miles per hour, rotating 66,000 miles an hour around the sun, right on course through the night. It didn't deviate. God is so good. And I get to see, hear, feel, and experience a new day. The smell and taste of coffee. <laughs> Pure joy. <laughs> God created the amazing coffee bean that sparks so much joy. <laughs> this tea bag, zero joy. <laughs> Absolutely no joy whatsoever. But that's all right, because you have coffee. Waking up grateful. <laughs> Waking up grateful is a choice. And if you start to practice this every day, life won't feel so heavy. What do you have to be grateful for today? Third, be average at almost everything. I love that. Be average at almost everything so that you can be great at something. This comes out of Mind Shift, Erin McManus' new book. To be great at something, whether it's teaching, writing, creating, parenting, or leading, you have to be average in almost everything else. Things I was average at were meetings, 
Uh, annual reviews, hated them. I just quit doing them. <laughs> Counseling people. And prayer breakfast. I mean, I believe in prayer, and I believe in breakfast. <laughs> but not as a group together. Okay, leave me alone. I'm not doing that. <laughs> or anything that had to do with numbers or systems. HR was continuously upset with me for not filling out forms and jumping through things. But in order for me to live wisely and do God's will for my life, I had to be average in almost everything but teaching. That was for me. If I had to be in a meeting, I tried to make it mid-afternoon when I only had one functioning brain cell left. <laughs> Second Timothy 4, 5 says, look, you got to fulfill your calling, not somebody else's calling, but your calling. My calling was to teach and lead. I had to be great at that, which meant that counseling, traveling, and one-on-one -on -one mentoring was out. If someone got past my assistant <laughs> and dared knock on my door Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday morning when I was writing for 30,000 people who I had to face in three days, someone had better had died. And then, even then, it was a question mark. And I know what some of you are thinking. Well, good for you, Bob. Good for you. But I'm in a small church, small organization, three staff. I don't have an assistant. I don't have the luxury to spend four mornings a week on message prep, and I get it. I lived that life for five years in Fallen, Wisconsin, and in the first 10 years of Eagle Brook. But here's the raw truth. The same catalyst for growth in that little church in Fallen that went from 60 people to 250 people was the same catalyst for growth at our church in Eagle Brook. It was making the weekend the best we could. That was the catalyst. And it started with teaching and music. That was our key. It was trying to be great at what mattered most and average at everything else. It's not to diminish small groups, children's ministry. It's not to diminish, you know, service stuff. It's not to diminish any of that. But if the weekend falls flat, we're done. There is no ministry. And I knew that. My responsibility was to be great at those two things. Paul said, devote yourself to teaching, in my case. Gang, you can't be devoted to 12 other things if you're going to be great at the one thing that matters most. So where do you need to be average? Because to be great at something, you have to be average at a lot of other things. Fourth, learn to disappoint people and be okay with it. Be happy about it. In fact, you should disappoint somebody every week. <laughs> one of your most common phrases should be, sorry, I can't do that. Because every time you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to something else. Every time you say yes over here to an invitation, person, trip, or rehearsal dinner, you're saying no to dinner at home with your family. So, who do you all need to disappoint this week? So that you can live wisely and fulfill your calling. Who do you need to disappoint? Your mom? It's a biggie. In-laws? A demanding sibling? I've been there. A high-maintenance friend? Or a small group that's run its course? I can tell you, I am a living disappointment to some of my extended family members who have mastered the art of passive-aggressive guilt. But it protects me from foolishness and allows me to do God's will for my life. Learn to disappoint people and say no. Fifth, embrace the value of sacrifice because when life and leadership gets hard, it's tempting to look for an easy out. But I can tell you leading anything is hard and requires daily sacrifice. Several years ago, a study was done that measured work productivity 
And this was the question they asked, are people at their best when they are under-challenged, appropriately challenged, or dangerously over-challenged? They found that people who are under-challenged are never at their best. These are people who are still at home in their COVID clothes taking Zoom calls on their mid-morning walks, <laughs> which is fine. But gang, I saw a grown man, no kidding, at my granddaughter's gymnastics meet just recently wearing pajama bottoms and slippers on a Saturday. He's under-challenged. <laughs> he, he's, he's not hireable, in my view. <laughs> when you can't find your pants for a public event, that's a problem. So, <laughs> under-challenged. Second, appropriately challenged. You might think this is the sweet spot. Actually, if you're appropriately challenged, there's really no need to pray. Rely on teammates or stretch yourself because everything is doable on your own power, so that's not the sweet spot. Dangerously over-challenged is also not the place you want to be, and if you stay there too long, something's going to break. There's actually a fourth category, and this is where people are at their best, appropriately challenged plus. Interesting. We do our best work slightly above the appropriately challenged line where you are stretched beyond your abilities and you're forced to rely on God and on your teammates and on prayer. You are in over your head just enough that it's going to take a sacrifice of time and effort to pull this off. Romans 12 says, offer your body. I mean, your body, just your being, your entire Effort, offer your body as a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable to God. Gang, following Jesus requires sacrifice. But so many people are looking for the off-ramp to comfort and ease. So they fantasize about the day they can sleep in till 10 while they book their, their next trip to Palm Springs. And there's a place for that. I get it. We all need something like that. But if your goal is a life of comfort and ease. The result will be disappointment and regret. This is the illusion of retirement, by the way. There are more sad and pointless people sleeping in beach chairs because they thought comfort and ease was the ultimate goal, only to find you're just sleeping in a beach chair and it's empty. Every human heart longs for two things. Every one of us longs for love. We want to be in loving relationships, that's number one, and every one of us longs for purpose, to make our life count. But both of those things require sacrifice. A few months ago, I was sitting in an Indianapolis hotel alone on a Saturday night. I thought, what am I doing here? It was raining, miserable night. They got my Chick-fil-A order mixed up and I was back in my hotel room. No honey mustard barbecue sauce for my spicy deluxe chicken. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I was not grateful. <laughs> but my very next thought was this. This is exactly where I'm supposed to be teaching at a great church, helping their pastor and staff. Every part of it was hard, and I was exhausted, but my soul was so alive on the backside, I wouldn't have traded it for anything. After 67 years, here's what I've learned. Fulfillment and joy is always on the other side of service and sacrifice. That's the way you get it. We think it's comfort and joy, or comfort, comfort and joy, it's not. Fulfillment and joy is always on the other side of giving yourself up to a worthy cause. Finally, run to the Father to lift the weight. Run to the Father because there will be times when you've asked for help, woke up grateful, embraced the value of sacrifice, and you'll still get crushed 
by a rogue wave of betrayal or loss and nothing I've said will solve that. The only thing that'll matter, the only thing you can do is run to the Father who will heal and hold you. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened. Jesus invites us to come to him, and that's actually what some of us need to do today. Just come to him. And he says, all who are weary, that's me. It's probably you. He knows we're how we're made with limitations and weaknesses. And here's the promise. He says, I, I, I will give you the rest and peace and protection and power that we need. By the way, this isn't a one-time thing we need to do. This is a daily thing that I need to do. Just to go to Jesus. Jesus, I'm coming to you now. I'm tired. I'm weak. I'm in over my head. I'm coming again. I'm asking you to fill me with your love, joy, power, and peace. Todd Pierce is a professional horse trainer who specializes in taking horses that have been abused or neglected, and he tries to restore them. And it's so moving at times that he'll often do his work in front of a crowd to demonstrate the hope and healing of the Father's love. Watch this short video and then I'll close on. Just learning a little bit about um, the conditions that, I'll say the home that she came out of. She's actually pretty comfortable. <laughs> Brian, come on, boy. So I'm purposely making as light of this as possible because to her, this is a big deal. Like, this is a little bit of a trauma response. This is uh, out of control. I don't know what to do. And the worst thing I can do is focus on what she's doing wrong right now. She's finding her peace. She's figuring it out. She's self-soothing. Oh. Yeah. Sometimes we don't know what to do other than just run to the Father and say, Papa, help. Out of control. Don't know what to do. God trying to figure it out. Sometimes all you can do, sometimes the best thing to do is to come to the Father and say, Papa, help me. She just said, come to me. Come to me. It's an open invitation. All who are weary in their soul and feel the heaviness of life, come to me. And I will give you rest. I'm so grateful for each of you here. Thanks for letting me speak. I've been where you are, and at times still am, and I love you. I love for what you stand for. I love for the fact that you are allowing God to use you in small and in big ways. I'm grateful that you gave up some time today to be here. It shows you where your heart is, and God loves that heart. He knows your heart. And he loves you more than anything. Thanks for letting me be here today.